Hello everyone, my name is James East and I am the new minister of Dorchester Baptist Church. What an answer to prayer it has been that me and my family were able to move even at the end of lockdown and come here and be with you all. I say be with you all but I'm sitting here in the church building all on my own uh, as we are still plotting and planning exactly how we can implement the new changes that the government is bringing in, uh, which mean we can gather in some way for some form of worship, though what that will look like, no one is quite sure just yet. So I have been praying a great deal about what I must bring to you as a piece of teaching now that I am beginning here at DBC. And when I was praying, I felt that the Lord led me very, very strongly to St Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And I've been sitting here at this desk, praying and writing, and I have in my hand a piece of paper. Uh, in fact, I have in my hand several pieces of paper, which constitute my first sermon to you all as your full-time minister. If you've got a Bible, and I have a, a great array just here, you might like to turn to Paul's letter to the Romans. We're going to be looking at chapter one uh, initially, just the first couple of verses, and then we're going to have a sneaky peek at chapter three. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. First of all, I want to say this. It is a thing of wonder. This letter is absolutely amazing. I wrote a letter a couple of days ago and I made all kinds of mistakes as I wrote it. And I was able to look at my computer, check it over and over again, give it to people to check. And finally, I asked Wendy in the office to send it out for me. And the first thing that happened was several people contacted the office and said, it seems to end rather abruptly. Has the end been chopped off? I must rather shamefacedly admit, no, the end hadn't been chopped off. I thought that was a great place to stop. But now I read it again, I think, no, that was not a good place to stop. I might have said something like goodbye. That would have worked. But anyway, why is Paul's letter a thing of wonder? It is incredibly complex, so detailed, filled with such beautiful theology, and he simply stood up and dictated it. Can you believe that he did such a thing? He got his friend Tertius, and he called him over to his tent, and he sat down and he spoke the book of Romans. Romans is astounding and for anyone to simply stand and deliver it is a miracle. There's only one reason that can possibly have happened. Romans comes straight from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filled Paul and Paul spoke God's words. How precious Romans is to us. The next thing I want to say is that it's a thing of reflection. Paul wrote it in about AD 58, and he had been on the road planting churches for nearly 25 years at this point. And that's a good long ministry, especially when every couple of weeks or so you get savagely beaten or stoned or your ship sinks or various other things that happen to Paul. He puts a pretty detailed list down in one of his letters. Paul was on his third missionary journey in AD 58. And when he composed and he dictated this letter, he was reflecting. He'd had a moment to stop and think about what he had been doing and what he would be doing. And he wrote to Rome, a church that he hadn't founded, a church that had, we presume, not written to him with a list of problems and issues. He wrote to Rome with a list of his reflections, his thoughts and meditations on the Christian life, as I've said at the beginning, driven by the Holy Spirit. 
how right it is that the letter to the Romans has become a thing of reflection. You can't really come to Romans and just have a quick look or read it from one end to the other and feel like you've got it. Each part of this is so deep, so wonderful, it demands our reflection and I hope if nothing else, even if you stop the video here, that you go off and read Romans and really lose yourself, immerse yourself in a part of it. Another thing about Paul's letter to the Romans is this. It is a thing of excitement. Look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 23 and verse 11. It reads as follows. The following night, the Lord stood beside him, that's Paul, and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Rome was important. Rome was a place where things were going on. God was doing something wonderful. God said to Paul, I want you there. I want you there and I want you to do something for me. And so Paul got increasingly excited about this as a prospect. How marvellous. God has revealed his plan and he's revealed my part in it. I want to be there. For some weeks and months before I've arrived in Dorchester, people, lovely men and women of God, have said over and over and over again, God is doing something here in Dorchester, here in Dorset. The Lord is moving, doing something exciting. They've usually added a little caveat and said, we're not sure what, but God is doing something. That makes this letter appropriate for us to study because Paul was writing it to a group of excited people who were right in the midst of things God was doing. And we, I believe with all my heart, are going to be a people who are right in the midst of what God is doing. I want to summarise chapters 1 to 3. And I summarise them in four words. Four words which, when I wrote this sermon, I decided to put as the title of it. Those four words are our problem, God's solution. So in chapters 1 to 3 of Romans, Paul talks about some bad news before he gets to the really wonderfully good news. Paul explains that humankind as a whole does so much wrong. Sometimes it denies the very existence of God. And Paul has no truck with this. He says all of creation sings his name, announces his being and his goodness and his love. As Paul puts it, we have no excuse. But even if folks admit that God is there, that doesn't mean that they love him, follow him or obey him. Often people even with a belief in God, treat him as if he's just one of us. And that won't do. It was once put rather like this. Just imagine I told you here on YouTube that I had swatted a fly. You would think, so what? He swatted a fly, I don't care. He's picking on flies and it really isn't that much of a problem. Imagine I then told you that I had killed a bird this morning. You'd probably start to think slightly differently about me. You would wonder if I had any reason to, if perhaps I was a, a hunter or I was protecting crops. And if I had done it just for a bit of a giggle or out of wanton cruelty, you would quite rightly think less of me. In fact, a friend of mine once told us when he arrived at our house that he had driven through a flock of birds at such breakneck speed that he brought down several of them and we thought less of him. Let's raise it a little, let's make the animal a touch bigger. What would you do if I told you that I had hurt a cat? Now I'm 
not saying I've hurt a cat. In fact, I like cats and I wouldn't want to hurt one. But 10 years ago, a lady called Mary Cole was filmed on CCTV stroking a cat, which she then grabbed by the scruff of its neck and threw into a wheelie bin. The cat was called Lola. Now, Mary Cole became a really disliked lady. There were all kinds of vitriolic comments posted about her. And she was chased by news reporters who asked her, what have you got against cats? Why did you do this terrible thing? And she couldn't really answer. That's how upset we can get over a cat. What if I were to talk in terms of hurting a human being? Terrible thing. You would quite rightly, if I said I had hurt or beaten or been cruel to someone, think very little of me. And you probably wouldn't want me as your minister. It would have severe consequences. So look at the scale we've drawn. We don't really care about flies. We do care about birds. We care a lot about cats. We care an enormous amount about each other, or we should. Where is God on this scale? How much higher than us on that scale is God? I put it to you that God is almost infinitely, almost infinitely, what am I talking about, is infinitely higher than us. Infinitely more worthy of honour, love, worship, respect, and when we do something that hurts God, it is very serious, far more serious than hurting a fly, a bird, a cat, a person. When we hurt and upset God, that is grievous and it's punishable and deserving of punishment. It's an awful state that we're in, says Paul, though to be fair, Paul doesn't talk much about flies or birds or cats in this section of Romans. Now we come to God's solution. Our problem, God's solution. And we find it put very succinctly here in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through to 26. It begins with the words, but now. So exciting. We've heard all of this extremely concerning, worrying stuff about the awful state humankind is in because of its lack of respect for God. But now, but now God has done something, not tomorrow or in the future, but now. There's good news. And Paul goes on to say something quite wonderful. The difficulty is, he says it in an incredibly complex way. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What I want to do now is pick that apart just a little bit and try to unfurl just how beautiful and how wonderful that complicated message really is. In verses 22 and 23, Paul says something which folks always find very hard to understand. He says there's no difference. We have all sinned and we all fall short. 
For the word sinned, he uses a lovely Greek word called hamartia. It's actually a term from archery. And if you draw your bow and twang your arrow, and the arrow doesn't even make it to the target, let alone hit it, the word they would call out was hamartia, meaning it fell short. Hamartia is the word Paul chooses to use to describe our sinfulness, our wrongdoing. He says there is a level of goodness we need to be able to have a relationship with God and we fall short. Be you Hitler or be you Mother Teresa, under your own steam you cannot get to heaven. You cannot have a relationship with God because we fall short. That takes us to verse 25 and verse 25 reads as follows. Talking of Jesus Christ, it says it was he whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. The word propitiation, as it's put in the ESV, is a Greek word, hilasterion, and over the years scholars have argued a bit about what that might mean. Some have said it might mean expiation. The majority have said that they believe it means propitiation. If you're not sure what those terms refer to, the easiest way to put it would be this. Expiation of sin or wrongdoing would be just forgetting it, blotting it out, getting rid of it. It doesn't matter anymore. Oh, it's gone. Whereas propitiation is rather more serious. Propitiation implies that sin always is punished, never goes away easily, has to be paid for. And the implication is this, that God never winks an eye, doffs a cap or just ignores sin. He always hates it. He always punishes it. But in a remarkable way, in his son Christ Jesus, he takes the punishment upon himself. It's an astounding notion. And I believe that the rest of the chapter points towards Hilasterion really meaning propitiation. Our passage ends with verse 26. And verse 26 reads as follows. All of this was to show God's righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. That verse reminds me of a story I heard many years ago when I was just a lad. And in that story, which was told to me to try to explain something of the good news, there was a judge and this judge sat in his seat of justice and in the dock before him was a criminal. And the judge fined this criminal quite justifiably a hundred thousand pounds, a vast amount of money that this man couldn't possibly pay, despite the fact that he was richly deserving of this punishment. Then, having passed sentence, the judge stood up from his justice seat, stepped down from his bench and walked into the dock and stood next to the condemned man, whereupon he took out his checkbook and he wrote a check for £100,000, covering the full amount. So, he was both the judge, the just one, and the justifier, the one who made everything right. God did all of this to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier. <gasps> oh, no. So that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is take 500. Oh, what I would give for a pulpit and a congregation right about now. What I'm desperately trying to say is that God has done it all for us in Christ Jesus. He is fully just, fully good, fully hating of sin and wrongdoing and every kind of evil. And he is fully loving, fully gracious, fully forgiving. 
And if you look back in verse 24, you find out why. I love verse 24. It says we're justified by his grace as a gift. Have you ever come across anything more wonderful in your life? Lord God, why would you do this for me? Dreadful sinner. An awful person. Someone who does not deserve a relationship with you in any way. And what does God say? He says it's a gift. Ah, just thought I'd do it for you. I'd give it to you as a present. Please, I pray. If you're watching this film and you have accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, rejoice and share that gift with the world. And if you're watching this film and you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, please reach out to him today. Put your hand in his. Give your life to Jesus. Let him fill your soul. Let his love surround you. Let him make you whole. As you give your life to him, he'll set you free. You will live and reign with him eternally. In Jesus' name. Amen.